So, I actually have the privilege of doing a uh, two um, sermon series. So next week, I'll be back. As long as I, like, maybe, maybe if I fail, Pastor Mark will take me aside and be like, <laughs> maybe we'll call that off. But don't think that's going to happen. But it's going to be really fun. The series that we're going to be doing is called Walking with God When Others Don't. And tonight's sermon will be titled To Do Justice. The, the series is going to be out of um, Micah 6, 8, and then Hosea 12, 6. So I'm just going to read both those passages just as the, the core passages for this series. So Micah 6, 8 says, He has told you, a man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And Hosea 12, 6 says, Therefore, return to your God, Observe kindness and justice, and wait for your God continually. Now, as I was praying and preparing for this series, um, recently with our Promise Bible Reading Plan, we've been going through Isaiah and now in Jeremiah, and I was just really drawn to the prophetic language of those passages and just felt like I was supposed to preach on something out of the prophets, um, which... Sometimes I feel like we don't talk about the prophets enough because it can be difficult to talk about, it can be confusing, but um, there's a lot of wisdom there, so hopefully we can glean something from this. So um, tonight we're going to be speaking about justice, um, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week we will be speaking um, about kindness. So these two passages really stuck out to me because I'm like, wow, these are two completely different prophets. And they basically get the exact same thing from God. The elements of return to your God. And then to do justice and to observe kindness. And then the, where they deviate more is in the last line there where one says to walk humbly with your God and the other says to wait on your God continually. Uh, so this week we're going to be looking at how we do justice in the context of walking with God. So the context for both of these verses is there are prophets spoken to the children of Israel um, in the land of Israel, and it's God's people, his chosen people. He brought them out of Egypt. He's done all these things through Moses, through the prophets, through, you know, all through judges, where he's demonstrated he's real, he's God, he's amazing, and they, they really should be like, you're God, let's follow your rules, let's do it your way, because whenever we don't do it your way, things go bad. Um, but unfortunately, when these prophets are speaking to God's people, um, unfortunately, they have turned away from God. And we know that eventually they're going to be judged and the, the land of Israel is going to be conquered by other nations. Um, but in both these verses, the prophet is speaking to the remnant in Israel, saying, return to your God. Observe kindness and justice and wait for your God continually. Now, as we talk about justice tonight, I wanted to start with kind of our normal understanding of what that might be, our human definition of justice, which when I was looking up online, there's, there's several different, but what really struck me was that justice was basically just the execution of being just. And then what just was was basically just this concept of whatever is fair and good being done. And for me, that was a very unsatisfying definition. I mean, like, well, this just kind of leaves us back to this arbitrary what is good and fair. Um, and unfortunately, as we look around at our culture or if we look back through history, what is considered good, just, and fair varies an awful lot. Um, which means that looking to our culture can't be a solid place to go, okay, this is what justice, this is how I should live out justice when God tells me to. <clears throat> we can see that through governments over the years. There has been many times where a government will pass a law. You know, if you think of, you know, communist nations or the Nazis or all these things, they were, a lot of those nations or those evil just tyrants rose to power legitimately, like legally. 
And then they did horrible things with their laws and with their court systems and what, at the time, people were calling justice. Um, even we see this um, in the family. You know, parents are supposed to do justice and kind of, you know, help their children find that. And myself, personally, I have little Jonathan. He's about four months old now. So I, personally, haven't had to do any, like, real parenting. I just kind of have to keep him alive. <laughs> um, he doesn't know how to, like, throw rocks yet or, <laughs> you know, do some fists. So I haven't really had to lay down justice. But as he gets older, I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to be justice for him and tell him, well, no, you, if he has siblings, eventually he'll be like, no, you can't, you know, push your sister or you can't do these things. And I'll have to intervene, you know, in that. But even as I, as I'm going to try my best to be a godly parent to him and execute justice in our household, inevitably I'm going to come short. Inevitably I'm going to fail. Um, so the culture's definition of justice isn't a sure thing even myself or others as we just try to work it out, that itself isn't a sure thing either. And our human attempts to do justice reminds me an awful lot of actually the Pharisees, how they had all their rules, all their things to make themselves right with God and you know, do justice by other people. And we know that Jesus' words to them weren't that kind. <laughs> he called them a brood of vipers at one point. And it's you know, because if we just try to seek justice in our own human ability, it doesn't get us very far. Romans um, 3.23 talks about how all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So obviously it's not in humanity that we find the definition of justice that both Micah and Hosea are encouraging us to do. Thankfully for us, uh, we can find that in Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 which says, the rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just, and God is faithful. <clears throat> a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteousness and upright he is. Here we see that God himself is the definition of what is just. He never does injustice. Everything he always does, says, thinks, is just. So when we are looking to do the justice that Hosea and Micah are talking about, we need to have God, Jesus, be the definition of what that is. You know, oftentimes there's that um, bracelet that people used to wear. I don't know if it's that common anymore, but it's the what would Jesus do? When it comes to justice, it, it's that too. It's what would Jesus do? That's kind of a cliche thing that people used to, or some people still do, wear those bracelets. But it's an important reminder and as we're looking for what justice is, it should be, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus um, judge this? Also, we're very blessed to have the word of God, which is what God says is just. So, now that we've kind of established that God is the definition of justice, we're now just going to turn to his word and go through some different areas of our lives um, in which he's shows us how to be just. And then if we read Proverbs 21.3, it says, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And this was spoken to the you know, old covenant people um, and also in the context of um, Micah specifically. Earlier in that chapter, chapter 6, God is basically berating his people, saying, like, you bring me sacrifices, but you're sinning at the same time. And it just shows us how important us actually living holy and just lives is. It wasn't just that he wanted the, you know, the people to do the religious things that made them right with God. He actually wanted their hearts to change. He actually wanted their lives to change. Um, they were basically thinking in their heads, well, you know, I, I can go do this thing that I know I'm not supposed to do, but if I have a cow that I can go sacrifice, then we're good. And I know that we as Christians now, we are covered by the blood of Jesus, and we don't go do that. Even that, and it sounds so absurd, like I'm going to make sure I have a cow so I can go do the bad thing. But for us as Christians now, 
we need to make sure that we're not abusing God's grace. It's amazing what Christ has done for us on the cross. He has paid for our sins once we have accepted him. Our past sins, our present sins, and our sins that we will inevitably um, commit. But we shouldn't take that lightly. We should remember at all times the cost that it took for Christ to pay for our sins. And we should strive to live our lives justly. And not just be like, oh, Jesus has got it covered. Because the, the wonderful thing is he does. <laughs> He's got us covered 100%. But we want to be coming to him with a heart of repentance, not a you're going to pick up the tab kind of mentality. So God takes justice seriously. And we see throughout scripture that we are supposed to do justice in our speech. Really the first passage that jumps into your head as soon as you, know, you have the idea of speech and justice would probably be from the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, um, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness. <clears throat> and for a lot of us, like when I think of this verse, I'm like, yeah, if I was dragged in front of a court for something and you know, I had to testify, it would be quite easy for me to be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. Like, I am on the spot here. I am going to tell the truth. I'm not going to bear false witness. Like, it would be very easy to do that. Um, but then I was thinking about all the other times in my life. You know, maybe you're at work. And either you or your coworker messed something up and the boss is ticked off. And then they're prowling around trying to figure out what happened, who's to blame, who's going to take the fall. You know, and in those sort of situations, there isn't a crowd watching or a jury watching. Are we tempted to twist the truth? Kind of be like, oh, no, no one was really at fault. It was just this random thing that happened. You know, and sometimes it might not be for ourselves. It might be trying to cover for someone else, like our, our buddy at work, that we're going to you know, twist how things happen to try to bail them out of being in trouble because they messed up. But we, as Christians, need to make sure that we are being just in our speech, that we are telling the truth, that we're not bearing false witness, regardless of the consequences. Also here, Isaiah says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Here we see that with our words, we're supposed to speak truthfully about what things are and what things aren't. We're not supposed to call things that are evil good and things that are good evil. And unfortunately, in our culture, there are many issues that the world has just got completely upside down. Um, probably one of the hot topic ones is the whole transgender issue and pronouns and all of this. Um, maybe you've run into that work where people are like, here are my pronouns. Please use them. Um, personally, I haven't actually experienced that that much, which I'm thankful for because it is an uncomfortable situation to be put in. And as Christians, we need to be careful how we interact with that. Because this verse is very clearly telling us that we're not supposed to call things that are evil good. We're not supposed to lie about the reality of how things are. The Bible's very clear there are men and there are women. And they're different, and that's, that's such a good thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just want to walk through a few different ways that we might be able to apply this. Because there could be an instance where, like, say, you're in the line at Target, and the person behind you is talking about something or talking about their pronouns or whatever. In that situation, the loving thing might to do would be like, you probably should pray and ask God, is this actually a time where I'm supposed to intervene into this conversation or am I not involved? Because if I'm not involved, maybe it's not like, maybe I shouldn't say anything. If there's situations like that. Like this verse isn't saying you always have to shout, you know, what you think the Bible says about things to everyone at all times. But there might be other times where you're in a group of friends and they're talking about something, and they have opinions about something the Bible is very clear about. And your silence, like that is a step in the right direction, not affirming what they're talking about. But sometimes they will infer your silence to be agreement. And then maybe you should be like, well, 
guys, do you want to hear a, a, you know, a counter opinion? You, know, you can be gracious about it. You can be loving in the way you talk to them about these hot topic issues. But we still need to make it clear what we believe and what is true. And then there's times where you might be in a situation at work or other places where with, the, say, the transgender issue where they're trying to force you to, say, use the pronouns or conform to something that you know is wrong. And then, as Christians, we have to do the really hard thing and be like, unfortunately, I can't um, go there with you. I'll, maybe I'll just, like, my advice is just, just use their name instead of, you know, avoid it if you can, um, just not to cause them hurt. But at the same time, if they're really coming down on you, you have to be honest and truthful that you're going to do what is true and what is right, not what culture is going to um, say and dictate. So we need to do justice by our speech. We can't call evil good and good evil. Also, we need to do justice with our finances. Proverbs 20, 23 says, different weights are an abomination to the Lord, and a false scale is not good. And this one, too, similar to kind of like the Ten Commandments. You look at it the, with the you shall not bear false witness. We're kind of like, yep, don't rob, don't steal, don't cheat people out of stuff. But just like the do not bear false witness, I think it's good for us to take an introspective look and kind of take it a lower, deeper. You know, We may not be robbing banks, but are we tempted to do other lesser things? Um, one thing that was a temptation in my life within the last year is about a year and a half ago I got a car, and it wasn't the greatest decision. Um, it has lots of problems. I will not let my wife drive it, actually, because I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> a few months ago, we were doing uh, birthday bags, and Pastor Mark was in the car with me, and he was like, your car is making noises. <laughs> and there was. There was some thumping from the corner. So at one point, I was kind of like, this car has problems. I really wish I hadn't purchased it. Maybe I should try to sell it. Um, but then I was thinking, to my, like in my head, was kind of these ideas, well, it's got a lot of things wrong with it. I'm not going to be able to get very much money for it. And then this little thought pops in my brain, well, what if you just don't tell them that there's things wrong with it? Or not, maybe like it's in there, but I don't like, I'm not up front with it. You know, if they drive it and they hear the noises, I'm not going to deny it. But like, maybe I'm just not publicizing all the things that I found out that are wrong with it that I didn't see on my first test drive, but now have found out over the, you know, months. And then I was really convicted after I had that thought being like, that's, that's not honest. That'd be me, like I'm frustrated that I got ripped off and now my thought is to try to rip off someone else. <laughs> Which, by the grace of God, I have not sold this car and I have not ripped anyone off. Um, <laughs> you can pray for my safety on the roads. You can also pray that I'm not tempted to sell it in a dishonest way. But I'm sure all of us have moments like that where there's just a thought of, maybe I could get ahead this way. Maybe my finances would be a little better if I bend this rule. I do something slightly dishonest, not a big thing, but just something. Like not telling someone there's a noise that happens when you decelerate from a certain speed at certain angles. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> but anyway, it's something that I think we need to think about and take seriously. Um, because oftentimes we can kind of just put ourselves, or at least I will, when I put myself in a box, where I'm like, I'm good in this area. I don't steal. I'm good that way. And you kind of just gloss over verses and God's encouragement to do that. And it's good to take a deeper look and be like, hmm, what are actually the motivations in my heart? Are there times where I'm tempted to do that? Also, we see that we are to do justice in our actions. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And this is just a reminder that when it comes to doing justice, you know, you would say vertically between the two of like other people, myself and others, and in relationships, um, that is very important. But when King David sinned with Bathsheba and got her husband killed and then gets confronted on it, when he comes to repentance, it's not, oh, I've sinned against these people, God forgive me. It's, Lord, I have sinned against you and then also these people. And we remember that when it comes to justice, it's not just in our relationships. It's not just external, but it's between us and God. 
us doing justice is us trying our best not to sin. And that is very difficult and very hard, and I'm very thankful for what Jesus did on the cross, because obviously all of us aren't able to actually live justly. Um, but we just need to be very intentional about striving to live justly, because as I talked about earlier, we don't want to uh, just accept his grace and keep on living and not change who we are or how we live. Also by our actions, um, we need to be defending those who are weak. We need to be standing up for what is justice when it comes to our relationships. Jeremiah 22, verse 3 um, says this. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness. Deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. And also do not mistreat or do violence to the stranger, the orphan, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. And here is a whole list of things that were very applicable to the Israelites at this time of things that they needed to basically be on watch for to make sure justice was done. Thankfully, um, the being robbed and the shedding blood one isn't something that I don't, like, hopefully none of us have actually directly encountered that, and it's quite rare in our society, thankfully. But for us, it might not actually be going and delivering the person that's being robbed from whatever's going on. For us, helping justice be done might be you know, being willing to write the police report or call when something's happening and step in. Or it might be um, <clears throat> looking out for a widow or, in our society, a, a single parent or a child in foster care, advocating for them, stepping in the gap and being like, OK, I'm going to take you by the hand and actually help you make sure that you're not forgotten by society and that justice is done on your behalf making sure that we are speaking for those who can't speak and seeing justice done. Also, we see in the scriptures that justice is to be done through government and through the authorities that God puts in place. Romans 13, 4, um, this is Paul talking about government and the role of that and um, the minister's that God appoints in places of authority, and it says, for it is a minister of God for you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. And here we see that God does appoint governments and law enforcement and all these things to carry out justice. Now, there are times, like as we were looking at the children of Israel, where their, their court system wasn't doing so well. Um, they weren't carrying out justice in their courts. But what's interesting is God actually raises up another nation to then come conquer them and do justice. So we should be looking for the government to carry out justice. And we need to recognize that that, that may not be all of us. Like, trying to get involved in politics or these things. But there are people, Christians, there are good, godly men and women that God will call into government, will call into law enforcement to see justice done, to be ministers of God in that role. And we should be in favor of that. But the biggest thing we should do, in my opinion, and I was really just convicted about this when studying for this message, is actually out of 1 Timothy 2 when it comes in regard to seeing justice done in government. And this is the first three verses of 1 Timothy 2, where it says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And as I said, some people are called into the fray of seeing justice done through government. But I think universally what we're really called to is praying for those that are in authority that God has put there that should be doing justice. And sometimes they don't, but we should be praying that God would put people in places of authority that will do his justice, not human justice. And I don't want to get too controversial. Um, but it is election season, and 
I'm sure all of you guys' news feeds are full with tons of just clickbait that's trying to get you anxious and get you to believe certain things. And I just encourage you in this time where it's really easy, um, no matter what you think about politics, to you know, pick some candidate or some theory of government and be like, that's going to save us. That's going to bring justice to our land. But that really isn't. No politician, no theory is going to bring justice to our land. What brings justice to our land is when there are people that believe in God that administer God's justice. And we need to be praying that God would put those people in position so that justice is done and that we can live tranquil and quiet lives and not have to get tangled up in the craziness of all of um, politics and the implications. So I just really encourage you guys, don't respond in fear or hate. Respond in love and in prayer that God would move, um, particularly this November. Um, as the election approaches, just pray that God would move and uh, appoint people um, that would carry out his justice and not man's justice. And then last here, this one isn't something that we are to do, but it's something that justice is not, and that is vengeance is not justice. Um, the verse that probably pops to mind for some of you is Romans 12, 19, which says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And that's quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35, which says, vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. And here we see in these two verses, that there are many times where we are going to see injustice in just broadly in life, and we're not going to see the justice we want. Um, and it isn't really on us necessarily to fix that. Paul is saying here, don't take revenge. And I think Deuteronomy clarifies that when it says, in due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near. We can take comfort that God is going to make everything just in the end. That no evil, no injustice is going to be left unjudged. But we live in this time now where God is suspending his immediate judgment of evil. Because I know for me, myself personally, there were times where I was doing evil and I wasn't under Christ yet. <laughs> And I'm personally really glad that God didn't serve justice to me before I got to the point of knowing Christ. And we, as we're looking at the world, and sometimes you'll see something that happens, and you're like, God, why in the world would you let that happen? But we need to remember that it's his mercy and it's his grace that he lets justice tarry so that people would be saved, so that people could come to him. So, and in that gap, in that gap between when the evil is done and God's going to bring the justice, we ourselves need to not be tempted to try to play God and jump in there and do the vengeance. Now, in closing for tonight, just want to go back over some of our main points here. We saw here tonight that we are to do justice in our own lives and to seek that because it's something that God really cares about. Uh, that it's not something, and this is another note here on doing justice, is that we are not supposed to do justice in our own might, and our own power. I just gave this whole list of ways you know, in our speech, in our finances, in our actions. But if we set out just to try to do that in our own strength, we're going to end up basically just creating another system of justice that's human. We need to abide in Christ, and that's why in both Micah and Hosea, it ends with, and walk humbly with our God, or in Hosea it says, and wait for your God continually. We need to pair our striving to do God's justice in our own lives with abiding in him, letting him work through us. Because number one, we don't have the ability to be just, so we need his grace to sustain us, but we also don't know the perfect way to take his perfect word in his Bible and apply that justice. We need him to be 
working in us. You know, you don't know if you're going to be in the grocery line. Is that the situation where you really shouldn't say anything? Or maybe you actually do need to say something and speak up the truth. And we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be abiding in him, walking in him, so that we know how to apply the justice that he tells us to in our own lives and how we live and how we act. Because we don't want to become people who are so stuck on the letter of the law, or what we think, honestly, is the letter of the law, that we end up going too far or missing other parts of what God would have us do because we're just so fixated on trying to do a set of rules. So I want to encourage you to, you know, this, this whole sermon has been about striving to be just in all these different areas, but we need to marry that with abiding in Christ and letting him work through us and having the Holy Spirit work through us as we do that. So I just want to encourage all you guys to seek to do justice in your life. Seek to do that in your actions, in your thoughts, in your, in your work, in your job, in your financial transactions. I really encourage all of you guys to seek to tell the truth even when it's uncomfortable, even when there's social consequences for telling the truth. I really encourage all of you guys to just become aware in your lives when there's people who might be you know, widows, orphans, people who are vulnerable that are around you that maybe you could stick up for, maybe you could advocate for. Um, it may not be the old, like the, how the Bible talks about it, specifically widows and orphans. It might be, as I said earlier, foster care or single parents with children that just aren't really being taken care of. And just encourage you guys to, to think about that, to think about and be open to the Holy Spirit's moving for you to step in and step into those situations and bring some of God's justice into those situations. I also really just want to encourage you guys again, just with everything going on in the nation, just to pray. Pray that God would bring justice um, through our government and pray that there would be, you know, we'd be able to have a peaceful life. And in all these things, that we would abide in Christ, that we would let him work through us, let him sanctify us, let him help us do this justice. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you um, just for this opportunity to speak before your people. God, I ask that everything, of everything I said tonight, that if it's of you, that it would just land in their hearts and that they would just be able to take something away that would make them more like you, make them a more effective witness, make them um, just be able to be more just like you. And God, if there, there are things that I said that were just from me, I ask those things would just fade away and then I would remember them. I ask that you would uh, just bless this time, um, bless the food later, and just bless our time of fellowship. Amen. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to have...